Okay, so today we're going to be looking at um, functions and graphs. Okay, so we're going to be looking at the modulus functions, mappings, um, the domain and range, combining a few more functions. So this is an extension of GCSE as well as pure one. Okay. So we're going to have a look at the modulus of the functions, um, which is brand new. Okay. Then mappings versus functions domain and range a little bit brand new we've seen some before composite functions we should be very happy with this is from GCSE uh, inverse functions again from GCSE and then transformations of functions when we're transforming the modulus of the function that's brand new okay so we've got a mix of new things and of um, things that we should already know so the modulus of a function is nice and easy. What we are finding when we find the mod modulus of a function is essentially it's the positive value, okay, so the non-negative. So if I said to you, you know, what is the modulus of minus 4, well, we take the positive value, which is just 4. If I said to you, what's the modulus of 6? We take the positive value, which is still 6. Okay? And, you know, what it does is it just gives us the magnitude, the size. So how this works is, you know, sometimes when we square root, we obviously get a plus or a minus. But when we square root an answer, um, for example, when we're using Pythagoras, okay, we have a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Essentially, if we were to square root 144, we would get negative 12 or 12. Okay, but when we're dealing with Pythagoras, we're dealing with length. We can't have a negative length. So essentially, we're taking the modulus of that answer. We're taking the positive value of that answer because we are working in length. Okay? So... What we're going to do now is we're going to have a look at these examples, okay? We're going to, what we're going to do is work out the answer and then take the modulus. So for part A, we should all be happy that we have f of x equals the modulus of 2x minus 3 plus 1, okay? And we're going to input 5 instead of x. So we're going to have equals. Now, whenever we substitute, we use brackets, okay? So, f of 5 equals the modulus of 2 lots of 5 minus 3 plus 1. Now, if we work out inside the modulus, we've got 2 lots of 5, which is 10, minus 3, which is 7. So, we've got the modulus of 7 plus 1. Now, if we take the positive value of 7, it is just 7. So, my first answer is 8. For the second example, f of minus 2 equals the modulus of 2 lots of minus 2 minus 3 plus 1. 2 lots of minus 2 is minus 4. Minus 4 minus 3 is minus 7 plus 1. Um, the modulus of minus 7 is in fact 7. So this becomes 7 plus 1, which is 8. And then lastly, when we're substituting in 1, we're going to have 2 lots of 1 minus 3 plus 1, which is going to give us 2 times 1 is 2, minus 3 is minus 1 plus 1. The modulus of minus 1 is 1. So my answer is 2. When we substitute in values, if y equals x is essentially, we'd get y equals x, we get 0, 1, 2. Okay, but we have y equals modulus x, which, which if we take the modulus of minus 1, we actually get 1. And if we take the modulus of minus 2, we actually get 2. So if we were to draw this graph, we have our x and our y, Okay, we have 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2. Then we'd have minus 1, 1, minus 2, 
two. Okay, maybe not quite like that. It's about there. Okay, there we go. Ooh. So this is our graph, y equals modulus x. Okay? And what we find is, if we think about the graph y equals x, it's normally this one, isn't it? Okay? But because we're always taking the positive values of x, because in this case the modulus, what we find is our negative part here is reflected in the x-axis. Okay? So this is what I mean by it looks like it's a lot of slides, but it's not because I've kept the answers in so that if my drawing isn't up to scratch, you can go back and look at it, okay? Right, so what you're going to do for me is I wonder if you could do the first example for me, please. Okay then, so in this case, we have y plus 2x minus 3. Now, if I just think about y equals 2x minus 3, I know it's going to um, have an intercept at minus 3, which is here, essentially. Okay? And then my gradient is going to be 2, isn't it? For every 1 along, I'm going up 2. So, if I just draw this graph as it is, okay, it's going to look... Something like this, isn't it? Okay. Now, we cannot have any negative x values. So essentially, all we're going to be doing is reflecting what's below here upwards. Okay. So this now is going to be... So now, our graph should look like the V. Did you get a V shape? No? <laughs> okay. It's okay if you didn't get a V shape, okay? So this, this, I'm literally just sketching, okay? Now, if I wanted to, I could put the values in, okay, to get an answer. But what I want us to know is, because it's a sketch, we need to be comfortable just sketching, okay? So this is my sketch. Now, I know this here crosses at minus 3, because this is my y-intercept. So this part should cross that three. Okay. Now I know that this is when my y equals zero. Okay, if I substitute in y equals zero and I add three to, um, I'm gonna add three to both sides divided by two, this is actually one and a half, isn't it? Three over two. So this is going to be 3 over 2 and 0, okay? When we sketch graphs, we just need to put the points of intersection. That's all we need to do. That's the whole point of sketching. Now, this is if you were to just to sketch it, okay? Some of you um, drew a table, didn't you? Yeah? So if you did draw a table... Um, and you had your x and y, and you did your minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2. If we substitute in our values, so if we do x equals 2, 2 times 2 is 4, minus 3, 1. Okay, um, 2 times 1 is 2, minus 3 is minus 1, but we take the modulus, 1. Zero times two minus three, we take the modulus. Um, minus one times two is minus two, minus three is minus five, that becomes five. Uh, minus two times two is minus four, minus three, which is minus seven, so we take the, this becomes seven. Now, the only problem with doing it this way is if we were to plot these points, so we'd get Minus 2, 7 is about here. Minus 1, 5 here. We're going to get 0, 3, which is here. Then we're going to get 
one, one, which is here, and then we're going to get two, one, which is here. But this doesn't actually tell us the point where it crosses the x-axis. Okay, this is why, even though we can use the table when we're sketching, really, we've got to think to ourselves, okay, I'm sketching. What are the points I need to know? Really, the, the main point you need to know is when x equals zero and when y equals zero. Okay? So, on the next one, it's going to say solve. It's going to say solve 2x minus 3 equals 5. So if you can imagine, we've now got this graph here, okay? And we know that this is 3 over 2, 0. And we know that this is 0, 3. So now we're saying this equals 5, okay? So essentially, this is my line y equals 5. We want to find where they intersect. Okay, so it's easy enough to find where they intersect on, the, on this side because we know this is, our, this is just 2x minus 3 equals 5. So then we're going to have 2x equals 8, x equals 4. We can substitute that into, um, we know that y equals 5. Okay, easy. On the other side, it's a bit different because obviously we've taken the modulus of the function on that side. So what we find is it is, because it's a reflection, as I said before, we've reflected this part here, haven't we, in the x-axis. To find this coordinate, we need to multiply everything in the modulus by minus 1. So this, in fact, becomes minus 2x plus 3 equals 5. Okay, so then we're going to get minus 2x equals 2, x equals negative 1. And as we've already seen, when we substituted in our value, to get y equals 5, it was at the point negative 1. Okay, so because this part of the graph here is the reflection in the x-axis, to find the second set of solutions, we multiply anything that's in the modulus by minus 1. Okay? Okay, so for the second example, we have 3x minus 5. Now, the graph 3x minus 5, we know it's going to cross at minus 5 somewhere. 3x is going to be quite steep. Okay, so we know it's going to be like this. Okay? Now, if we had 3x minus 5, where does, where, is, where does it cross the x-axis? That's when y equals 0. So we're going to have 3x equals 5, x equals 5 over 3. So we know this point here is 5 over 3, OK, and 0. Now, again, this would continue down forever, wouldn't it? OK, so actually, what we're going to do is we're going to reflect this part we know that our y-intercept was at minus 5. If we reflect it up, it's now going to be a positive 5. So this point here is going to be 0, 5, because we've reflected the negative part of the graph in the x-axis. Perfect. So then it says solve... 3x minus 5 equals 2 minus a half x. So we've got another graph, 2 minus a half x. Now, the graph of 2 minus a half x is not a modulus, so we're just going to draw y equals 2 minus a half x. Now, that means it's going to cross... Uh, my y-intercept is at 2, so roughly here. OK. And it's minus a half x, so I know my line is going to this direction because it's a negative gradient where does it cross the x-axis is when y equals zero so zero equals two minus a half x minus two equals minus a half x so four equals x so i know it's going to cross at four so then i'm going to have my nice 
So this is my line, y equals 2 minus x. So we can see, I know it's very difficult, but it actually crosses at two points here and here. So this is going to be 4, 0, and this one is going to be 0, 2. Okay, so it crosses at two points. If it crosses at two points, we know that when we are solving the equation, we need to do two different um, two different types. So 3x minus 5 equals 2 minus a half x. So this is going to be the positive side of the graph. This is going to give us this point here on the right-hand side. Okay? So if I solve this, I'm going to get... Um, Three and a half, so I'm going to get 7 over 2x equals 7, 7x equals 14, x equals 2. Okay? So x equals 2 is my first one. Then for my second one, I know it crosses on the left-hand side. So if it crosses on the left-hand side, because it was a reflection, we multiply everything in the modulus by minus 1. So we're going to get minus 3x plus 5 equals 2 minus a half x. So if I rearrange this, I'm going to get 3 equals 5 over 2x, 6 equals 5x, 6 over 5 equals x. So we have two solutions, x equals 2 and x equals 6 over 5. And that is where these two, that's where the line crosses the v, yeah? Okay, now it says solve, okay, so this was this question here. Okay, now the second part of the question says solve 3x minus 5 is greater than 2. Now, do you remember in pure 2 when we did this discriminant, okay, if it's greater than, what we're essentially looking for is where is the V greater than the line. It's greater than the line on this side and on this side. So we're going to end up with two inequalities. We're going to get X is greater than 2 and X is less than 6 over 5. Because this is our point 2 where it intersects and we want this line. So essentially anything this side, which is X will be greater than 2. And then on this side, it, we know that this crosses at 6 over 5. So we want everything that's less than that. If this was the other way around and it was less than, we would have x is in between 6 over 5 and 2. Okay, so if you look at the previous slide, it was good. But at least here you can see the graphs in... It is a lot better to see, okay? Okay, so test your understanding, okay? Now, the reason why we draw graphs as well, because if you look at this graph here, there's only one solution to the graph. So you know, do you need to take the negative of your modulus or the positive, depending on where the graph is, okay? So I'm going to do this first question with you, then you can test your understanding on the second one. Okay, so it says x plus 1 equals 2x plus 5. So the graph of x plus 1... Oops is this one here. So this is the original line. Okay, and then you can imagine it was, it was, um, it, this would be my graph. But remember, we reflected. So now, the modulus is these two. Okay? But this part is the part we reflected. So now when we want to solve this, we know the line 2x plus 5 only meets the, uh, the modulus of the graph in the modulus area. So we need to multiply this all by minus 1 to find the exact coordinates. So we're going to have minus x minus 1 equals 2x plus 5. So then we're going to have minus 6 equals 3x, x equals minus 2. So that is our coordinate minus 2. Now for the next one, you can see it crosses twice. So you need to take the positive and the negative of the modulus. Off you go. 
Okay, so we're going to need to take the positive, which is 4x minus 1, is less than 2x. So um, we are going to get 2x is less than 1, x is less than a half. Um, let's worry about the inequalities in a minute. And I'm going to get minus 4x plus 1 is less than 2x. So I'm going to get 1 is less than 6x. 1 over 6 is less than... So x is greater than 1 over 6, but x is less than a half. Doesn't make any sense. Um, so when you're doing this... Don't worry about writing the inequalities until the very end. Okay, just keep it as equals. So x equals a half and x equals 1 over 6. Now, because we want where the graph is less than the line, it's in between the two values. So that means we want a sixth is less than x, which is less than a half. These ones have been drawn out for you, just so that you've got it all on there. Okay, so what I would like you to do is questions 8, 9, and 11, please. So, what is a mapping, okay? Now, a mapping is something which maps one set of numbers to another set of numbers, okay? And as you can see, that sometimes the input, zero, can lead to multiple outputs, 4.4 and 7.2, okay? So, that is what um, a mapping is. Now, when we're looking at, if you think about it in a graph, okay, the domain is the set of possible inputs. So the domain is the set of possible inputs and the range is the set of possible outputs. Normally when we speak about domain, we are speaking about x values and when we speak about the range, we're speaking about the y values, okay? So please ensure that you are happy with that. Um, and again, there is a bit more of a definition on this slide. So, a function is where it's a mapping, okay, but, so it's a mapping, oh, put mappy, <laughs> it's a mapping, okay, um, such that every input has exactly one output. Okay, so it's a mapping, um, but every input has exactly one output. And what I mean by that is for every number in the domain, that gives one range only, okay? So it's, so it's unique. So for example here, if we have a look at this question, is this a function? Well, if you think for every value, okay, of x, we get a value of Y. Okay, so does one input have exactly one output? Yes, it does, because this input gives this output, this input gives this output, this input gives this output, this input gives this output. So this is a function. Okay, whereas for this graph here, if we have a look, if I put in this value of x, okay, I in fact get this output and this output. This is giving me more than one. So this is not a function, okay? 
So, 2 to the power of x. Okay, the way you want to think of it is, is if you draw a line from your x value, if it crosses only one point, it gives one output. If I drew a line here, it crosses two points. So it's giving me two outputs, not a function. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to, to discuss f of x equals 2 to the power of x, f of x equals root x, and f of x equals plus or minus root x. And whilst you're discussing this, I do think um, it would be appropriate if you use Desmos to actually draw the graphs to see what they're like for yourself. Or you may already know what these graphs look like. Please, um, I've just done that and I didn't even record. Okay, the last one is not a function because if we did f of 9, for example, and I did plus or minus the square root of 9, I'm going to get plus 3 or minus 3. It gives me two outputs. Okay? This is actually a one-to-many function. Okay? One-to-many function. Okay. Okay, and then there is a bit more explanation on the next page for you. So, we have a one-to-one -one function versus a many-to-one functions. So, even though a function has to have um, an input mapped to one output, so one input maps to exactly one output, multiple inputs can map to the same output. Okay, and what we mean by that is as follows. So, if we have a many to one function, okay, that means, and this is always a classic example, if I had two and minus two, okay, they could both map to four, couldn't they? Because f of x equals x squared. So, what you find here is, this one is a many-to-one function, okay? Because even though I can, I can put in 2 and minus 2, but we still get an output of 4, but this is still a function because for every domain value, there is only one, okay? I'm only crossing it once. Then, for the second part, a one-to-one -one function, normally when I think about this, I'm going to think of a straight line graph, okay? So, if we think, let's do f of x equals 2x plus 5, okay? And if I had minus 1, 0, 1, 2, for example, okay? If I put minus 1 in here, I'm going to get minus 2 plus 5 is 3, so that just maps to that one. 0 plus 5 is 5, that one maps to that one. 1 times 2 is 2, plus 5 is 7. 2 times 2 is 4, plus 5 is 9. Okay, so you can see every single one maps to another. Okay. So then, moving on to an actual type of exam style question, now that we've got the kind of skills and the knowledge and the understanding. It says... Find the range of each of the following functions. So, for the first one, it's nice and easy. It says f of x equals 3x minus 2, and our domain, which is our possible set of x values, is 1, 2, 3, 4. So, if I want to find the range, I literally just need to put in 1, 2, 3, and 4, and then I'm going to get an output of y values, and then I'm going to find um, the range. So, in this case, I've got f of 1 equals, f of 2 equals, f of 3 equals, and f of 4 equals. f of 1, 3 times 1 is 3, minus 2 is 1. f of 2, 2 times 3 is 6, minus 2, 4. f of 3, 3 times 3 is 9, minus 2, 7. 4 times 3 is 12, minus 2, 10. Okay? So, the range... Is everyone happy that those three dots mean therefore? Okay. Therefore, the range, and we need to use these types of curly brackets, which I'm not very good at, okay, is 1, 4, 7, 10. Because it's a specific range, isn't it? 
okay? And um, it's a state for the functions of one to one or many to one. This is a one to one function. Uh, function f of x equals one to one. Okay, part b. g of x equals x squared and the domain is between minus five and five. Okay, now this one's quite easy. If I just draw the graph a moment of x squared, we know that the graph of x squared looks like this, don't we? Okay? This is my x, this is my y. Now, if this... Oh, sorry, wrong way. Um, our x is between minus 5, so if this is minus 5 and this is 5, if I go up, because it's x squared, they should cross at exactly the same part. Okay? So our range is in fact, if we look, the graph starts at 0 and goes up to this point. Okay? So our range is going to be... 0 is less than or equal to x, um, no, g of x, because that's what our function's called, g of x, or you could put x squared if you want, which is less than or equal to, now if I input the value of 5 or minus 5, I know I'm going to get 25. So 25. So this is our range, okay? And... Because if I input 5, I get 25, and if I input minus 5, I get 25, this relationship is many to 1. So g of x equals many to 1, okay? Maybe instead of writing equals, we should put is, okay? So then, lastly, it says h of x equals 1 over x, and the domain belongs to the real numbers. Now... Because it belongs to the real numbers, you know, in here, if you did want to substitute in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, don't forget a real number is also 3.5. Okay? So it can give us a bit of an estimate of what's going on. So then, if I was to state uh, then 1 over x, we should all be happy with the graph 1 over x. Okay? Does anyone know what the graph 1 over x looks like? And it's only between 0 and minus 3. So I'm just going to do the positive side. Okay. If you think about it, if we put 0 in, 1 over 0 is not possible. Yeah? So you know, so what's going to happen is when we're drawing this graph, it's always going to come from, like, it's always going to get to 0, but it's going to come down. Okay. Like, it's always going to get as close as it can to zero. It's like an asymptote. Do we know what asymptotes are, yeah? So we've got an asymptote at zero. If we put one in, one over one is one. So we know that this is like one, one. If we put two in, okay, if you think where two is, this is going to become a half, isn't it? And then if we put three in, we're going to get a third. So we also have another asymptote, okay, on the line um, y equals zero. So then it's going to look like that. Okay, and it's going to try and get as close to the x-axis as possible. We should all be fairly comfortable with that graph. When in doubt, work it out. Okay, just put in a few values and go for it. Then, okay, so we want to know, so this is 0, and then this is going to be 3, isn't it? Roughly, I'm just guessing here. Okay, so we know, right, between 0 and 3... Okay, if we were to put in, um, wait there, I forgot what I'm doing. The domain is between, yep, so between zero and three, we're looking for the range. Okay, so the range is going to be what? This, oh, this value at three, we know is a third, don't we? Because if we put in 3, if we put in the value of 3, we get 1 over 3. So we know that this value is a third. So my range between 0 and 3 
is all of this area here, isn't it? Okay. So between zero and three, my range is all of this area. So what we actually have is that h of x, okay, h of x, and because it's less than or equal to 3, is always greater than or equal to a third, okay? And for every one input, there is exactly one output, so therefore h of x is one-to-one -one function. Okay? Just so you know that's wrong. H, that's a third, okay? Right then, um, here we go. So we have a piecewise function. So this one is where we have different parts, okay? And we will get these, and this is something new that we haven't seen before. So, it says sketch f of x and state the range of f of x. Okay, now remember we need to get really comfortable with sketching. So, I'm going to have, we always write our x and our y coordinate. Okay, and I'm going to sketch each one in a different colour. So, 5 minus 2x I'm going to sketch in blue. We know that 5 minus 2x essentially is going to have a negative gradient of 2. So, it's going to look like this and it's going to cross at 5 but I also want to know where it crosses the x-axis if I want to know where it crosses the x-axis I get 0 equals 5 minus 2x minus 5 equals minus 2x x equals 5 over 2 so it's going to cross at 2.5 so when I'm drawing this sketch forget about it says x is less than 1 for a second this is what this graph is going to look like Okay, and we know that here it's going to cross at um, 0, 5. And at this point, it's going to cross at 5 over 2, 0. Okay? But then what we have to do, and like the more we practice this, you won't have to do this part, but it's really good just for understanding. Okay? Now, um, I'm going to cover in purple what the actual line is. X is less than 1. Well, if I think 1, okay, is roughly here, isn't it? It says X is less than 1. And do you remember in GCSE, if it was less than, it would be a circle that wasn't coloured in. And if it was equal to or greater than, you'd colour in the circle. Do you remember doing that when we were doing inequality lines? You'd have, um, draw this on an inequality line, and you'd have minus 2, minus 1, 0... And one, two, three. And if it's x is less than one, you would have to go at one and you know it's less than. Do you remember doing that? Okay, so when we're doing piecewise functions, what we're going to do is imagine this is here. My new graph looks like this. My new graph is now this purple line. This blue line doesn't matter anymore. I was just showing you what the graph looks like. But now because I've got x is less than one, the graph, if this is 1, okay, it has to be less than. So we're only going to take values that are less than 1. So this is now my graph, okay? Now for my second graph, I have x squared plus 3. So x squared plus 3, I'm just going to draw in yellow, just for us to get a bit of an understanding, okay? x squared plus 3, we know the graph of x squared looks like this. And if we're plus in 3, actually, we're shifting it up by 3, aren't we? Okay? So, in theory, if this is 3, okay, I personally think it's going to look like this. Okay, so this is my graph, x squared plus 3. Roughly. I mean, I'm just, this is a sketch. It's not real. Okay? But then it says... X is greater than, I'm going to do this in a different colour. Let me just find one that's dark. This one, it's not dark. Okay, so then it says X is greater than 
or equal to one. So I know um, where I finish the graph at one, it's going to be a solid dot. So if I look at, this is where my one is, isn't it? If I go up, my one's about here. So now I've got a solid dot. And actually, I only want this part of the graph here. Okay? So I know this looks a bit complicated, but I'm going to re-sketch it for you, showing the only parts we need. So just a quick sketch here. Okay, we actually only need this line and then on top of it, because it's still one, it goes a bit like that. So it's going to look something like that roughly. Okay, so sketch f of x and state the range of f of x. Now the range is the possible y values. Okay, now the lowest y value is actually this one here, is when um, we put 1 into the equation. Okay, so if I put 1 in here, I get 5 minus 2, which is 3. So actually, my lowest value is 3, but it's less than 1, so it doesn't include 1. So my range is going to be greater than 3, not greater than or included. Okay, so f of x is greater than 3 because that's my lowest y value and it just goes on forever doesn't it if you think this line's going to go on forever and this curve's going to go on forever we have no idea okay then it says solve f of x equals 19 okay so this is saying solve f of x equals 19 sorry this is still part a here Okay, part B. We have f of x equals 19. Well, if we look at our graph, okay, and we look at f of x equals 19, I'm going to get a different colour. Imagine my 19 is here, okay, because f of x equals 19 means my y coordinate is 19. This is 19. So if I go across, I'm going to have 1x value here and 1x value here. So I know I've got 2x values. Okay? So, how I'm going to solve this. For the straight line, it's easy. 5 minus 2x equals 19, and I'm just going to solve it. So, 5 minus 2x equals 19, minus 2x equals 14, um, x equals minus 7. Okay, so that's my first value. For the second one, I do have x squared plus 3 equals 19. But if we remember the graph, we only kept the positive side of the x squared. So what we're going to do is, when I solve this, I'm going to get x squared equals 16, x equals plus or minus 4. But we only took the positive because it says that x is greater than or equal to 1. So we reject x equals minus 4. We reject that because it's not in our inequality. It's not in our, it's not in our um, range uh, domain. So x equals 4, okay? So reject x equals minus 4 as x has to be greater than or equal to 1. Okay, so we do reject it. Okay? So, we're going to get 4 and minus 7 are the answers. Okay, as I said to you, sometimes my drawings get a bit out of hand. <laughs> so, I have put, so there is a, a nicer drawing here that you can refer to if you need to, okay? But I do think it's really important to actually know what the graphs look like before so that you understand what's going on. To do two questions to test your understanding. Um, very similar to the examples I've just shown you. When in doubt, draw it out. Okay? You can use Desmos to help you. You can just input some values. Honestly, I don't mind. Okay? And C, um, have a look at the domain, and I'm going to come and help anybody who needs some help. Okay? Okay, so the graph of um, e to the x plus 2. The graph of e to the x... Um, looks like this and it crosses at 1 and it has an asymptote on the line y equals um, 0 
here. It will never reach this line. Okay, there's an asymptote there. If we then add 2 to um, the graph, we end up with x and y. And now this is going to move up to 3. And my asymptote is going to be at 2. So if I look at the range of values, which is the y the y um, values, the range, it has to be greater than 2. Okay, so we have f of x is greater than 2 for all real values because of our asymptote has moved. For the second one, we have x squared plus 4x plus 1. Okay, so very quickly, you need to draw the graph, x and y, and if we have x... Ooh... Okay, it crosses at, I'm not sure, because someone, has anyone solved this yet? What do you get? Yeah, you have to find the negative, so you have to complete the square. So we're going to get x uh, minus 2 squared minus 4 plus 1 is minus 3. So uh, it's going to be 2 and minus 3. So our minimum point is going to be here. It says it's between 0 and minus 5. So actually, I don't even need to know these values. I know between 0 and minus 5 might look something like this. But I know for a fact that this minimum point here, okay, is going to be what f of x has to be, g of x has to be greater than. So I know that... That. So minus 3 is less than or equal to g of x, which is less than or equal to, and if I put my value in a 5, um, I get 25 minus 20 plus 1, which is 6. Incredible. Okay, so now we're going to have the summary of the domain and range. Okay, so remember, our range is our possible y values. Okay, so our possible outputs. So, if I have a function and my function is x squared, my possible, my range is always going to be, if I square a number, can I ever get a negative? No, so my range of values is always going to be f of x is always going to be greater than or equal to 0. Because if I put 0 in there, 0 squared is 0. If I put minus 1 in there, minus 1 squared is 1. And if I put 1 in there, 1 squared is 1. Okay? Any number squared is always going to give me a positive value. Perfect. Okay, ln of x. What do we think about ln of x? What is my range of values? Now, make sure that we look here for our possible inputs. So x is always greater than 0. We need to know the range of ln of x. So, if you're not sure from the top of your head, a great thing to do would be to sketch these graphs. So, what we're going to do is we are going to call this one a... B, C, D. Okay? And you're going to sketch these graphs. If I just sketch X squared for us. Okay? Remember when we sketch, we always um, label our axes. And we know that X squared looks like this. And we can see that our range of values is our possible output, which is, you know, on our y-axis, okay? So my range is always going to be greater than or equal to zero. So what I would like you to do is for each, each A, B, C, D, please can you sketch the graph and then discuss the range. Okay, so, so, um, the graph of ln x, okay? If you're not sure what ln x looks like, you could literally draw a table of values. Okay, we have our x and y. And I always, I always go like minus 5, 0, 5. Okay? 
So I could just put this, so I'm in my calculator, I could put ln of minus 5. It comes up with an error. Okay? That would then tell me that maybe we can't have a negative ln. Does anyone know why we can't have a negative ln? Not yet? Okay, we'll come to that soon then. Right, and then if I put ln of 0, I get a math error as well. Okay. In my head, I'm probably thinking there's got to be an asymptote somewhere then, isn't there? Right? And then if I put a ln of 1. Ln of 1 gives me 0. I know I didn't have that in there, but now that's a ln of 1. So when my x is 1, I get 0. Okay, and now I'm going to just try a few. Uh, ln of 2, ln of 5 is like 1.6, okay. Ln of 100, it's like 4.6. Okay, so it must gradually just go up. And then let's just try ln of 1,000, 6.9. Yeah, okay then. So it's going to look like something like that, isn't it? Gradually getting bigger and bigger. Okay? But... If I now look, if I think of ln of 0.5, ah, it does give me a number. Okay, it gives me minus 0.6. But we know that ln of 0 is a maths error. So it's going to come down like this, and it's going to get very close to the y-axis, but it's never going to actually touch it. Okay, that means there is an asymptote on the line x equals zero, okay? So on the line x equals zero, there will be an asymptote. But it clearly states in the question, okay, which is what we should read, that x has to be greater than zero, okay? But, you know, it's just for purposes, if you're not sure how to work out a graph, literally, work it out, yeah? We will get to the stage where we do know how to do this off the top of our head. So what is my range of values for ln of x. So as we know, this is always going to continue going down to negative infinity. This is going to continue going up to negative infinity at a slower rate. So our range is our f of x is going to belong to any real number because it's going to be real for all values, for all inputs. So then for the next one, we have x squared plus 2x plus 9. Now, we should be able to draw, sketch this. And if we think about x squared plus 2x plus 9, when we sketch this, uh, to find our minimum point, I need to complete the square. So I'm going to get x plus 1. So then we're going to minus the square of inside the bracket, which is minus 1 squared, plus 9. Minus 1 squared plus 9 is going to give me x plus 1 squared plus 8. So our minimum point is minus 1, 8. So now when we draw the graph, okay, it's going to be minus 1, 8 is our minimum point. And our y-intercept is at y equals 9. So this is 0, 9. So that means that in actual fact... Our domain and range is f of x is greater than or equal to 8 because 8 is our absolute minimum point. So 1 over x, let's do our sketch. Now 1 over x is 1 over any number. So we know if we put in any, anything, well we just know the graph looks like this. Okay, it's not a very good sketch. This is 1, 1. And this is minus 1, minus 1. And we know, oop, we know we have an asymptote on the line y equals 0 and x equals 0 because we can't have 1 over 0. I know it says x doesn't equal 0. So, for this one, our range of y values, well, y never equals zero, okay? So, okay, so we know that y can't equal zero, which is our f of x, so our range is f of x cannot equal zero, okay? 
done. That's it. Okay, so e to the x, the graph looks like this. And it's going to cross out 1. So this is 0, 1. And again, we've got an asymptote on the line x equals 0. Now, um, e to the power of x is in fact the inverse of ln x. When we invert a function, it's actually a reflection in the line y equals x. Okay, so what you'll find if we go back to ln x and we put y equals x, if you've got a mirror and reflected that, guess what? Boom! E to the x. It's crazy, isn't it? Fun fact of the day. So because... Um, they are the inverse of each other, okay? When we have inverse functions, which we're going to be looking at in the next chapter, because we're going to be looking at inverse trig. I can't wait. Okay? Um, so it is a reflection in the line y equals x. So, this time, our range of values is f of x is going to be greater than zero. Okay, because we're never, because there is an asymptote on the line x equals zero, y is never going to get down to zero. Okay? Uh, sorry, not an asymptote on x equals zero, sorry, y equals zero. And y will never equal zero or be negative. Okay? Because it's never going to touch that line or cross that line, and the line being the x axis. So that means that f of x is always going to be greater than zero, not greater than or equal to. Okay, and then the last question, we have f of x equals x squared. And we want to know the range of values for this. So step one, draw the graph. So we know that x squared looks like this. But then it clearly says that minus 1 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 4. Okay? So if this is minus 1 here, and then this is 4 here, if I go up, that means that this graph actually now only looks like this blue line. Can you see? Forget about the whole graph. Because it's in between this interval, it's only the blue line that it looks like. So if I was to draw this again, Okay, it's just going to look like this. There we go. Okay, that's it. That's how the graph looks. Now, if we put the value of 4 into x squared, our y coordinate is in fact 16. If we put the value of minus 1, we get 1. But our minimum point is in fact at 0. Now, because we're including minus 1, x, and 4, we know then that 0 is less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to 16. Because again, our range of values is where we have, it's, our, it's on our y-axis, what can we get, it's our set of outputs. And here we can choose any value of x between minus 1 and 4, I'm going to get from 0 all the way up to 16. I could even get 15.49. Okay, this is why this is in that interval. Okay, any questions about this? So composite functions is what we've done in GCSE previously. Um, and it's literally, if we have g of f of x, it means work out f of x first and then substitute that into g of x, okay? For example, okay, if we had f of x equals x squared plus 4 and g of x equals 2x and I say find g of f of 2. Step 1, we find the function of 2, okay? Um, sorry, we find f of 2. So, f of 2 is 2 squared, which is 4, plus 4, which is 8. So, I know that f of 2 equals 8. 
So now if I'm finding g of f of 2, that means in theory I'm finding g of 8, aren't I? Which is in fact 2 times 8, which is 16. Now, we might be doing this with algebra. So f of x is x squared plus 4. And if we're finding g of f of x, I'm going to substitute x squared plus 4 everywhere there's an x. So we substitute that in here. We should be happy with this from GCSE. So then, here we go. Um, here's some examples for us to look at, nice and easy. So we have f of x equals x squared plus 1, g of x equals 4x minus 2. f of g of 2. Well, first of all, we're going to substitute in g of 2. So, g of 2 is going to equal 4, lots of 2, minus 2, isn't it? Which is, in fact, 6. So, f of g of 2 actually means f of 6. So now, we're going to have f of 6 equals 6 squared plus 1, which equals 37. So, f of g of 2 is, in fact, 37. Amazing. f of g of x. So, g of x equals 4x minus 2. So we want f of 4x minus 2, which is g of x. So f of 4x minus 2. So I know there's a few x's, but what you've got to think of, this is saying f of this number, okay, is this number squared plus 1. So f of this number is this number squared plus 1. I know there's a lot of x's, but you've got to think x is just how we're writing this, okay? It's abstract algebra. So... How I would write that then is I would write, um, instead of x, we're going to write what's inside the bracket. 4x minus 2 squared plus 1. 4x minus 2 squared is going to equal um, 16x squared, 4x times minus 2 is minus 8, minus 16x plus 4 plus 1. Okay, so that means f of g of x equals... 16x squared minus 16x plus 5. Okay, and again, I've just expanded that in my head. Okay, we, you know, we're year 13 now. I shouldn't have to um, show you how to expand this. Next, g of f of x. So that means f of x equals x squared plus 1. So I'm going to be doing g of f of x, which is g of x squared plus 1. So everywhere there's an x in g, I'm going to substitute in x squared plus 1. So this is 4 lots of x squared plus 1 minus 2. So I'm going to have 4x squared plus 4 minus 2. So g of f of x is 4x squared minus 2. Okay? f squared of x means f of f of x. f of f of x. No, I think I did too many f's then. It's just f of f x. Right. So, I know that f of x equals x squared plus 1. So, if I'm doing f of f x, I'm doing f of x squared plus 1 which means I've got x squared plus 1 squared plus 1, okay? So I'm now going to have x to the power of 4 plus 2x squared plus 1 plus 1. Expanded that in my head. So that equals x to the power of 4 plus 2x squared plus 2. And then the last type of question, solve g of f of x equals 38. Well, lucky for us, g of f of x equals 4x squared minus 2. We worked that out earlier, okay? This is something I prepared for us earlier. So, that means we're solving 4x squared minus 2 equals 38. So, 4x squared equals 40. x squared equals 10. x equals plus or minus the square root of 10. Ah, oh, absolute rookie error here. What's plus 4 minus 2, everyone? It is 2, so this is positive 2, which means this is positive 2, which means this is 36, which means this is 9. So x equals plus or minus root 9. 
x equals plus or minus 3. Please be really careful with your negatives here. I think I just went a bit too fast, okay? But if it was minus 2, it would have given us plus or minus root 10. Either way, same, same. Okay, so find f of g of 3. Okay, step 1. What is g of 3? So g of 3 equals 3 plus, whenever we substitute, we always put brackets, 3 plus 1 over 2, which is in fact 4 over 2, which is 2. Okay? Now we need to find f of g of 3. g of 3 is 2, so in theory we're finding f of 2 which equals the modulus of 2 lots of 2 minus 8. So the modulus of 2 times 2 is 4 minus 8. So it's the modulus of 4 minus 8 is minus 4, which in fact equals 4. So my answer, I'm going to write it down, f of g of 3 equals 4. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to, we know that g of x equals x plus 1 over 2. So if we're doing f of g of x, well g of x is x plus 1 over 2. So this we're finding f of x plus 1 over 2. So in our f of x, wherever there's an x, we're going to substitute in uh, x plus 1 over 2. So we're going to have the modulus of two brackets, and our x is x plus 1 over 2 minus 8. Now, uh, if I was to expand and simplify, here I've got two lots of something over two. Those twos are going to cancel out, so I'm just going to have the numerator, okay? So I'm going to have um, the modulus of x plus 1 minus 8, which equals the modulus of x minus 7, okay? So what we're now saying is the modulus of x minus 7 equals x. And this is what we have to solve, okay? Now, when in doubt, graph it out, okay? So if we, if we drew this as a graph, remember, when we have something equal to each other, it means they're the same as, yeah? Also, where do they intersect, okay? So step one, if I was to draw this, if I just draw the left-hand side for now, so the modulus of x minus 7, Okay, imagine this was just the graph of x minus 7. This is a straight line graph. x has a gradient of 1 and my y-intercept is minus 7. Okay, so it's in fact going to look like this line here, isn't it? Okay, and what do we know about... Uh, so this is the line. We know this crosses at minus 7, but where does y equal 0? That is here when x, in fact, equals 7. Okay. But when we draw the modulus, again, we reflect in the x-axis. So this actual graph, the modulus of x minus 7, is going to look like this. Because remember, we're only reflecting the negative. So this is the graph, and it's going to cross here at positive 7. This is still 7. So this is my graph, the modulus of... So we've just drawn the modulus of x minus 7, okay? And this side here of the line is y equals x minus 7, okay? But this line here is actually y equals minus x minus 7, isn't it? And let's draw that line a different colour. Let's call this orange. Okay, so this was the negative part of the line that we reflected, yeah? Okay, now I'm going to draw the line y equals x. So y equals x has the same gradient as y equals x minus 7, okay? But they have different y-intercepts, so they're going to be completely parallel. They're never going to cross. And the line of y equals x, we know looks like this. Okay, so 
It intersects on this part of the graph that we had to reflect. So when we solve this, we, in previous ones, what we used to do was we'd forget about the modulus. We'd have x minus 7 equals x, yeah? And then what we'd do is we'd do, we'd mul to get rid of the mod uh, modulus, we'd multiply everything by minus 1 to get minus x plus 7 equals x, yeah? Now, if you look, it's physically impossible. If we did x minus 7 equals x, well, I could take away x from both sides. I get minus 7 equals 0. What do we call that? A mathematical error. It's not possible, is it? Is minus 7 the same as 0? No, so this one has no solution, which we know it doesn't have a solution from the graph because this line is parallel to this line, okay? Then on the other side, we have minus x plus 7 equals x. So x7 equals 2x. So our x coordinate is 7 over 2, which is here. Um, I think that's all we've got to work out. Okay, you've got two questions to have a go at, and then I'll quickly go through them. Ooh. Okay then, so find f of g of 1. So we're going to substitute in, we know that g of 1 is going to equal 3 minus 4 lots of 1. So g of 1 is going to equal minus 1. Nice and easy. Then we're going to do f of minus 1, which is going to be equal 2 modulus minus 1 plus 3. Now if we take the modulus minus 1, we get 1. 2 times 1 is 2, plus 3 equals 5. Okay, part B should have been nice and easy. Now we're moving on to part D. Don't know what happened to A and C. Okay, let's pretend we didn't see them. Okay, so that was part B. Okay, part D. Solve the equation g of g of x equals g of x all squared. So first of all, g of g of x. So we know that g of x is 3 minus 4x, so we're going to get... 3 minus 4 lots of our g of x, which is 3 minus 4x. Okay, I'm just going to expand this first. This is just g, g, x, yeah? So 3 minus 12 plus 16x. 3 minus 12, so I'm going to get minus 9 plus 16x. That is g, g, x. Then we have plus. Okay, and we're plusing g of x all squared which means that we're adding 3 minus 4x all squared, okay? 3 times 3 is 9, minus 4 times 3 is minus 12 times, minus, times 2 is minus 24x plus 16x squared. So now I'm going to add these two functions together. So I'm going to have 16x squared minus 24x plus 16 is minus 8x, minus 9 plus 9 is 0, so that equals 0. Lucky for us, we have a factor of 8. And x, we have a common factor. So you could use this in the calculator if you want. Your a is 16, your b is minus 8, your c is 0. Or we could just factorise. So 8x, we're going to have 2x minus 1. Okay, equals 0. So, when does this equation equal 0? Well, in, I've got two terms multiplied by each other. So these two terms multiplied by each other to give you 0... That means 1 has to be 0 times something, and then the other one. So here we're going to have 8x has to be equal 0, so x is 0 is one solution. And then I have 2x minus 1 has to equal 0, so 2x equals 1, x equals a half is another solution. So solve the equation, and when we solve the equation, x can either equal 0 or x can equal a half. Okay, next question. f of x equals e x. e to the power of x plus 2. g of x is ln of x. Part b. Find f of g of x. Okay, so g of x equals ln x. So we're f of ln x is essentially what we're going to be doing, aren't we? Okay, so this equals e to the power of, and instead of x, we're going to write ln x plus 2. Now, as we know, 
E is the inverse of ln, so we're just going to be left with x plus 2. Things on the next halfway through. Have a, oh, they do have our age, but try them with nearly to look at them. And then, here's everyone. So, today we're going to look at inverse functions. So, when we think about an inverse functions, um, have you seen sometimes those magic tricks that say, I think of a number, um, you know, you pick a number between 1 and 10. And you pick a number and then it says, add 5 to that number. Multiply it by 2. And then they give you a sequence of other things to do. And then, ta-da, either you get back to the original number or you get back to a number that they want you. And they'll say, your number's now 7. Okay? And it's amazing. We can do that using the inverse of a function. So, for example... Um, 2x plus 1, the inverse of 2x plus 1, well, if you think, what was the last fit, you know, what was the last thing you did to x? Well, the first thing you did to x is multiplied it by 2, and then you took away 1, uh, added 1, sorry. So the last thing you did was add 1. So to get back to the original number, we're going to take away 1, divide by 2. Again, this is just from GCSE. And a little challenge, which we'll come back to, explain why the function must be one-to-one -one for an inverse function to exist. Right. So, we have f of x equals 3 minus 4x. Now, what I um, just find easy to do is, if I substitute in, instead of f of x, I'm going to write x. equals 3 minus 4y and then I rearrange to get y equals so I'm going to do x minus 3 equals negative 4y so x minus 3 divided by negative 4 equals y now just to say we don't really like having a negative as a denominator just like that so if I divide everything by minus 1 on the left hand side okay or multiply everything by negative 1. This is the same as writing y equals 3 minus x over 4. Okay? So that means my inverse function equals 3 minus x over 4. Okay, for the second one, we're going to start with the same. We're going to have x equals y plus 2 over 2y minus 1. So if we want y equals and we've got two y's, um, we need to make sure they're all on one side of the equation so we can factorise it out. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 2y minus 1. I'm going to get 2xy minus x equals y plus 2. I'm going to rearrange this to get all the terms with y um, on one side, everything else on the other. 2xy minus y equals x plus 2. I'm going to factorise out y. y bracket 2x minus 1 equals x plus 2. And now to get y completely on its own, I can divide both sides by 2x minus 1. So y equals x plus 2 over 2x minus 1. So my inverse function equals x plus 2 over 2x minus 1. So here, we can see that our inverse function is the same as our original function, okay? I'm going to take a look as to why that is in a minute. So when we graph the inverse function, um, we reflect in the line y equals x. I remember we discussed that before. So when we are um, drawing our graphs, we reflect in the line y equals x. So that means that when we have our domain of f, remember our domain is our possible y values, okay? For the domain of the inverse of the function, it's going to switch. Instead of being our possible y coordinates, it's going to be our possible x coordinates. So the range... Sorry, I've said that the wrong way around. Our domain of f 
is our possible x coordinates okay um i was looking at what it was saying here so the range of values for the inverse instead of it being our y coordinates it's going to be our x coordinates okay so the inverse of the function has the opposite range and domain so when we have a function f of x, we have our domain and range. Our domain is our x coordinates and our range is our y coordinates. Everyone happy? When we have the inverse of the function, our domain is our y coordinates and our range is our x coordinates. They're the opposite. So they're the opposite because we reflect in the line y equals x. So then, here's an example. If g of x is defined as g of x equals root x minus 2, find the range of g of x. So the range of g of x, it tells us that x has to be greater than or equal to 2. So the range of g of x, if we substitute it in 2, we're going to get square root of 0, okay? But also, if I substitute in 3, I'm going to get 1, it's going to go on. So f of x is, um, no, g of x is always going to be greater than or equal to 0. Okay, then it says calculate the inverse of g. So step one, instead of writing g of x, I'm going to write x. And everywhere there's an x, I'm going to write y. To get rid of a square root, I'm going to square. So x squared equals y minus 2. I'm going to add 2 to both sides. x squared plus 2 equals y. So that means the inverse of g equals x squared plus 2. It says sketch the graphs of both functions, okay? State the domain and range of g of the inverse of x. Now sketch the graph of both functions. Well, first of all, I'm not sure how to um, sketch the square root of x squared minus 2. But I do know how to sketch x squared plus 2. And I know that the inverse of x squared plus 2, the sketch of that, the reflection of that in the line y equals x, is going to give me the square root of x minus 2. I could use a table to work it out, but it just makes more sense for me to do it this way. So step one, I'm going to um, draw my axes. Okay, and remember whenever we sketch, in a label nice and clear. So, x squared plus 2. I know that it's going to look like this, and we've moved it up by 2. So then, um, what I now know is if I draw my line y equals x, We're going to have a reflection in this line. Now, this is something that I struggle with slightly, is if I think, right, okay, I need to reflect it. It's actually, if I reflect it in this line, it's going to look like this. Okay? But, as we know, so here's my sketch, but this isn't complete yet. Because it clearly says that x has to be greater than or equal to 2. So if I look, so my red line is the, um, the square root of x minus 2. So I need to, actually, if this is 2, oops. Okay, that was too big of a, a rubber. If that was 2, we know that this is going to cross here at 2. So we do not want any of this negative line here. So that can go away. Okay, but what I do know, and if I was to reflect that, then this part of the negative would also 
not technically be here. So this would be your final graph. So you have g of x is the red graph, and the inverse of x is the purple graph. Now again, you can just put values into a table to work this out. And you know that this is 2 and this is 2. So now when it says state the domain and range of the inverse of the function g, well remember our range is still our y coordinates, okay? But if in part a they told us to state the domain and range of the function g of x, you could just use the coordinates from the opposites. So our range is g of x is greater than or equal to 2. Okay, and our domain is that x is greater than or equal to 0. Because when we put 0 in here, we're going to get the output of 2. So, the function is defined by f of x equals x squared minus 3. Find the inverse of the function. So, I'm going to just do x equals y squared minus 3. x plus 3 equals y squared. Square root of x plus 3 equals y. So, that means the inverse of the function is the square root of x plus 3. Sketch y equals f of x and y equals the inverse of x and state the domain of the inverse. Now, the domain of the inverse is the range of the normal function, okay? So, when we're sketching this graph, we have y, we have x. Again, I know how to sketch x squared minus 3, and it says x is greater than or equal to 0. So x squared minus 3 looks like this, okay? But we only want when x is greater than or equal to 0. So we need to rub out this side. Now, I mean, in the exam, I wouldn't always draw this whole thing. I'm just drawing it when we're showing examples and that's so you understand. Okay, where is x greater than or equal to zero? Well, it's right here, isn't it? Okay. Then I'm going to have my line y equals x, which is here. And we're going to do a reflection in that line to find the inverse. So, if I reflect in this line, there we go, it looks something like that. Quite pretty, actually. Okay? So, we have f of x is the purple line, the red line is the inverse of um, f. And it says state the domain of f. The domain of, sorry, the domain of the inverse function of f. Now, the domain, what does domain mean? The x-coordinates. Well, if we have a look, our domain here is going to be when x is greater than or equal to minus 3. Amazing. So do my domain is x is greater than or equal to negative 3. Because we know that this point here is negative 3. That's because this point here is negative 3. Okay. Okay. So let's just have a look at f of x for a second. f of x. My domain is x is greater than or equal to 0. And my range of values is, um, sorry, it's not f. It. My domain is x is greater than or equal to 0. My range of values is that f of x is greater than or equal to negative 3. For my 
my inverse, my domain and range, whatever the answer is, it's the opposite. So my domain is x is greater than or equal to minus 3, and my range is that f of x is greater than or equal to 0. Can you see how it was greater than or equal to minus 3 is now switched here? And then 0 is now switched with here. This is what I mean by it's the opposite, because we're reflecting in the line y equals x. Okay, but again, always look at the graph. Then it says solve the equation f of x equals f, the inverse of f of x. Well, whenever we're solving the equations, what should we do? Simultaneous? Put them equal to each other? So I have y equals the square root of x plus 3. And I also have y equals x squared minus 3. Okay? So I could put them next to each other. Um, x squared minus 3 um, equals root x plus 3. That's not going to be very nice, is it? Okay. If I do this now, I'm going to end up with x squared minus 3 squared equals x plus 3. To be honest, it's going to get a bit messy, a bit ugly. If you don't have the right calculator, we're not going to be able to solve it. So this is when you, as a mathematician, should think, oh, there must be an easier way. Okay? Well, the easier way is where they're going to cross is actually on this line, where y equals x. This is the place that they intersect. Okay? So, we could just use the first one, for example. y equals x squared minus 3, and the line y equals x. So, x equals x squared minus 3. x squared minus x minus 3 equals... Okay, then. Completely right. If I factorise or solve this, what do I get? x equals, using my calculator... 1 plus 13 over 2. 1 plus root 13 over 2 yeah, and, one minus. and x equals 1 minus root 13 over 2 so this is 1 plus 1 minus now 1 minus root 13 divided by 2 is going to give me a negative and as you know we're looking for a positive value so we're going to take x equals 1 plus root 13 over 2. Now, if I substitute that into f of x and my inverse function, they should both give me the same y coordinate. Okay? So let's try it to double check that we've done this correct. So, let's try 1 plus root 13 over 2 all squared minus 3. What does that give you? And let's try our inverse, which is going to be the square root of 1 plus root 13 over 2 minus this one's plus 3. So both of those should give us the same answer. So both of them are roughly 2.307, so they are correct. Okay, so the function f is defined by f of x equals e to the power of x plus 2. Find the inverse function of f stating its domain. So, step 1. We're going to write y, oh, sorry, x equals e to the power of y plus 2. Okay? Um, I'm going to move the 2 first. So x minus 2 equals e to the power of y. How do I get y on its own? going to learn both sides or log both sides. Okay. So I'm going to get learn of x minus 2 equals y. So my inverse function f to the minus 1 
equals ln of x minus 2. So if we're going to draw these, we know that uh, the graph of e of x crosses at 1. So now if we plus 2, we're going to have our asymptote at 2. So the line y equals 2 and it's going to be crossing the y-axis at 3. Then if I have to draw the inverse, remember this is also a reflection in the line y equals x. So now we're going to have our asymptote on the line um, x equals 2. And then it's going to cross at, oh no, it's not quite. Okay, so it's going to cross the x-axis also at 3. And make sure you've put all the coordinates. It says coordinates of any points where it crosses the axes, which is what we have done. Okay, exercise 2D. Um, please just make sure you try and do all the questions. Okay, so sketching the modulus of a function, um, f of x, and then sketching where the modulus. So there's a difference between sketching y equals the modulus of f of x and sketch y equals the modulus of x. So first of all, if we think the modulus of the whole function, that means we have to take the positive. So in this case, if this is f of x, if I take the positive of everything, this is actually going to be like this. So what our sketch is actually going to look like, it's gonna come down, and then it's gonna do so everything is reflected in the x-axis, okay? So what we have here is a reflection in the x-axis. So um, reflection in x-axis for anything that's negative. So you can see this part was negative. This is what we're going to reflect. So any negative we reflect. Uh, reflection in x-axis for any negatives. Okay, and then the, the second one, we have the modulus of x. So every time we have a, if you think we're just, modul uh, we have the modulus of the function. So this is actually... So then what we're going to do is we're actually going to reflect anything that we've got on our positive side here um, onto the y-axis. So it's going to look like this. So we're going to have this, and then we're going to reflect it again. So then it's going to cross. Oh, I don't really think about your sketch. It needs to be the same. There we go. So... This one is we plot the positive and then, so plot the positive and reflect in y axis. <clears throat> so, the reason why we do that is because if you think, you know, for the first one, well, we're having the modulus of what the answer is, so of course this makes sense, you know. If our answer here was negative 3, the modulus of negative 3 is 3, so nice and simple. But for the second one, if we had x equals negative 3, it's going to become plus 3, and then it's going to go into the function, okay? So this is why we end up getting a reflection. So you see it in a minute once we get a few examples. So, test your understanding. So, let's have a look. So, figure 2 shows part of the curve of the equation y equals f of x. The 
Curve passes through the points P of minus 1.5 and 0 and Q, 0, 5 as shown. On separate diagrams, sketch the curve of the equation Y equals the modulus of our function. So for the first one, if I'm looking at the modulus of the function, we keep everything positive above the x-axis and anything below it, we then reflect. So if this is, I'm going to do this one in pink. So we're going to keep everything above the x-axis. Um, I'm actually going to do that again. Just make this. So here we're going to keep everything above the x-axis and then reflect whatever's negative. So then it's going to look like this. Perfect. Then we have the modulus. Uh, so then it's just the modulus of x. So it's f of the modulus of x. So anything that's um, on this side here, positive x, we're going to keep. And what we're going to do, reflect it in the y. So it's actually going to look like this. And now I'm going to reflect that. There we go. Um, it says, indicate clearly on each sketch the coordinates of the points at which the curve crosses or meets the x-axis. So if you were to draw these two separately, again, you would just make sure that you've written these points. So let's try some trig. Here we go. Um, first, test your understanding. Give it a go. I do suggest you do draw the sine curve between minus 2 pi and 2 pi. So we know it's going to look like this. So this is 2 pi minus 2 pi. We know this is pi, pi, 1, minus 1. This is x. And this is y. Okay then, so let's have a look, shall we? So the first one wants us to do the modulus of the whole thing. Now, we know if we do the modulus of the whole thing, we do not want... Oh, sorry. Let's start again. We do not want anything to have a negative y value of cut because we've taken the modulus. So our graph is actually going to be anything that's in the negative y. So anything that's down here is going to be reflected in the x-axis. So our graph is actually going to look like this. And we're going to have, this is still going to be pi. This is 2 pi minus pi minus 2 pi and we're going to have a maximum of 1 and our minimum is now 0. Now for the second graph we just want the modulus of x this time. So if we want to think about this we've got our x and our y. So we know that anything on the positive x side of the equation we're going to reflect it in the y. So we're going to draw this side first which we already know is just our sine graph. Oh, that's a bit of a terrible graph. Here we go. And now we're going to reflect that in the y axis. So now it's going to look like this. And then we need to put on all of our interception uh, where it crosses. So we have 0, we have pi, 2 pi, minus pi, minus pi over 2. So, nice and um, simple. Okay, um, please can you make sure that you do a few of these questions and then um, check your answers. Okay, so going back to recap of GCSE, okay? If it's inside the bracket, who does it affect? It affects x. And what do we do? We do the opposite of what it says. If it's outside the bracket, it affects y. And what do we do? We do what it says. So it's what we expect, isn't it? So, for example, inside the bracket, plus 2. So that means we're going to move it to the left 2. Okay, because plus 2 means to the right, but we're going to do the opposite. We're going to go to the left. And then it's two lots of the function, it's outside the bracket, so we're going to multiply 
um, all the y coordinates by 2. So my x coordinates, I'm going to take away 2 from all of them, and my y coordinates, I'm going to multiply them all by 2. So here we go. If I have, I have, I have, when I look at this graph, I think to myself, here is a point of intersection. They've given us this point, they've given us this point. So these are the points that I'm going to focus on. Now, it's, I know that I need to take away 2 from, so this is 0, 0. If I take away 2, I'm going to get minus 2. My y is, is multiplied by 2, so that's 0. For a, I'm going to get 0, so I know this is now going to be here. And minus 1 times 2 is minus 2. And then for my b, if I take away 2 from my x, 6 take away 2 is 4. And then I multiply my y value by 4, I get 8. So I have a bit of an idea what's happening. We know it's a bit of a stretch. So now when I'm going to draw this graph, x and y, I now know that this is going to look like this. It's going to come down. And I always draw it, and then I'll fill in the points. Oops, that was pretty terrible. There we go. Okay, so I know this coordinate now is zero minus two. I know this coordinate is minus two, zero. And this point here is four, eight. So we've sketched it, and this is, you know, we should be more than happy with this. So all we're going to do now is we're going to combine transformations, but just add in modulus. So here is a graph of y equals f of x. Sketch the graph of y equals minus f of 2x. So we know all the coordinates need to be divided by 2, my x coordinates, because inside the bracket, who does it affect x? And I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to divide them by 2. And then I've got a negative, so my y coordinates need to be multiplied by minus 1. Now that's actually a reflection um, in the x axis. So my new graph is going to look like this. I'm going to have x and y. I'm going to half all my coordinates and I'm going to reflect them. So it's going to come up here like this. This coordinate is now 3 minus 4, B. My A is now 1, 1. And we've still got our coordinate 0, 0. Now what we're going to do is part C is, first of all, it says minus X. Okay, so I'm going to do that first. Then I'm going to draw the modulus. So we're always going to do the transformation first and then the modulus. So if I have my y and my x. Now, is it inside or outside the bracket? Inside it affects x, and I'm going to divide all my x coordinates by a negative 1, which is actually a reflection in the y axis. Okay, so at this point it's going to come over here. So now I've got my reflection. So it's going to look like this. Perfect. This is what y equals f of minus x looks like. Now I've got the modulus of the whole function. So that means I do not want, if I have the modulus of the whole function, I do not want anything negative down here because it can't be. I can't have a negative y value. So anything that's negative, I'm going to reflect in the x-axis. So this part is positive, we can keep it. The part is below is negative, so I'm going to put it up here, reflect it. This part is positive, we can keep it. And this part is negative, so we're going to bring it up here. And this point is our, still our point B, which is minus 6, 4 now. This is now our new point A, which is in fact minus 2, 1. And we still have our point 0, 0. Okay, please always remember that, you know, to write down that it crosses through the origin. So, what I would like you to do is to test your understanding. So, this is from a call for June 2011.
Okay then, so um, question part A says, um, on a separate diagram, so I'm going to draw my diagram, X and Y. Okay, 4 is inside the bracket, it affects X, we're going to move it to the left 4, so this is going to move to the left 4. We know this coordinate's 4, so now this is going to cross here. And then, outside affects Y, we're going to multiply all our Y by 2, so now this is now going to be 0 and minus 6, and that's the only coordinate we've been given. So now, it's going to be like this, and this point is 0 minus 6. Okay then, part B says uh, y equals the modulus of f of negative x. First of all, step one, forget about the modulus. You're just going to draw, um, sorry I had x in my head, you're just going to draw the graph of f of minus x. Okay, so f of minus x, so Instead of this being 4 minus 3, it's going to be up here. It's going to be reflection, sorry, negative x. We're going to divide all it. So it's going to be over here. It's reflection in the y. So now we're going to have negative 4, negative 3. So this is the graph here negative 4, negative 3. Okay, this is the graph of f of negative x. We want the modulus of that graph, so now what we're going to do is we're going to make sure... Oh, it doesn't cross through the origin, so it's a bit more up here somewhere. So, which part do we have? This part here is positive, so I'm going to keep it. This part is positive, I'm going to keep it. This part down here is negative, so I need to reflect it in the x-axis. So here we go, I'm going to draw that in a completely different colour. Right, so the blue one is our final answer. There we go, and this coordinate is now minus 4, positive 3. And again, make sure, you know, it clearly says in each diagram, show the coordinates of the point corresponding to R, which we have. Okay, so what if there are multiple changes to x and y? Well, it's just like you think. Um, you know, you're not going to have this, but it is bid mass. Okay, so in the first one, you're going to do it's, is it inside or outside the bracket? outside, it's two lots of this function. So two lots of um, the function, so my y is affected, so you're going to times two to your y values first, then you're going to add one to your y values. Okay, so you're not going to get a multiple of x in your exam, but um, it's, you know, this is actually just the inverse of the function. So you're going to take away 1 and then divide by 2. Okay? But don't worry about that for this time being. Um, and then here we have sketch y equals ln of 1 minus 2x. So what do we have here? Um, we have, you know, a multiple of x. So again, we don't have to, we will come back to that later, but that's something that you don't have to worry about. Okay, please complete all of these questions and then mark them. Okay, so here is a modulus problem for you to solve. So given the function f of x equals 3 modulus x minus 1 minus 2, sketch the graph of y equals f of x. So when I'm sketching this graph, I know that if I was to sketch the graph of x minus 1, so I'm always going to do what I'm going to do in the modulus first, okay? So then we're going to change it about a bit. 
So I know if I was to sketch the graph x minus 1, um, it's going to y equals x minus 1. So we know it's going to cross here at minus 1. When y is 0, x equals 1, so it's going to cross here at 1. So here is my graph. This is 1. This is minus 1. Now, we know if we're doing the modulus of this, anything below the x-axis, I need to reflect in the x-axis. So now my graph is going to look like this. And I know that this is now 0, 1. So first step. Then the second step step is, is it inside or outside the bracket? It's outside the bracket, so I'm going to multiply everything by 3. So um, all of my y coordinates by 3. So the only thing that's going to change is this value here, where this value is going to be a 3. And then it says minus 2. So I actually have to shift the whole ground, uh, whole ground, the whole graph down 2. So my final graph um, is going to look like this. So if imagine if I shift it down, instead of crossing, um, sorry, this is now 3, isn't it? Instead of crossing it 3, it's going to cross it 1. And here, instead of it being 0, it's going to be negative 2. So here we are. We're going to have 1, negative 2. And we're going to have 0, 1. So again, it's really, um, you can draw this graph section by section. That is completely fine. Um, I personally find it easier to do that. Part B then says, find, state the range of F. Now, the range of F is the possible outputs, okay? So it's the Y coordinates. And now we can see the minimum Y coordinate is minus 2. So that means our function F of X has to be greater than or equal to negative 2. And then part C says, solve the equation f of x equals a half x plus 3. So for part c, we have f of x. Now we know f of x is 3 modulus x minus 1 minus 2 equals a half x plus 3, because this is what our f of x is. First of all, what I am going to do is I'm just going to sketch the line to see how many points of intersection. Okay, I'm assuming they're going to be 2, but let's see. So this is going to be at plus 3, so, and it's going to grow up by a half, so it's going to go a bit like this. Oh, no, probably a bit like that. I mean, I know that's 1, but this is, if we imagine that this is 3, 0, 3, and then this is where this is crossing. So we're going to have one solution here on the negative side, one solution on the positive side. So I know that we're, when we solve this, we're going to have two possible solutions. We're going to have, when the inside of the modulus is positive, so for example, free bracket x minus 1 minus 2 equals a half x plus 3. So I'm going to get 3x minus 3 minus 2 equals a half x plus 3 um, minus 5, and then I add it onto the other side. Um, I'm going to get... Minus 5 plus 3 is 8, so I'm going to get 3x, no, 5 over 2x equals 8. So 5x equals 16, x equals 16 over 5. And then for the other side, um, I'm going to multiply everything inside the modulus by minus 1. I'm going to have 3 lots of minus x plus 1, minus 2 equals a half x plus 3. So I'm going to get minus 3x plus 3 minus 2 equals a half x plus 3. Um, so I'm going to put all the numbers on the left hand side. So I'm going to get minus 2 equals 7 over 2x. I'm going to get minus 4 equals 7x, so x equals negative 4 over 7. Now, I just have solved the equation, and we've solved it. And if we look at, look at this, this is about right. We need a negative number, which is going to be here, negative 4 over 7. And then we're going to have 16 over 5. We know it's got to be greater than 1, because it's going to intersect greater than 1. So that is about right. 
So, um, there we are, we've solved it. Okay, please can you test your understanding, give it a go first, um, and then I'm going to go through it. Okay then, so this is the core four question, eight marks. So, um, it says, given that f of x equals 2 minus x plus 1, find the coordinates of the points P, Q, and R. Okay, so we can see they've sketched it here. Now, if we have a look at R... This is, R happens when our x, um, we need to find our x coordinate when our y is equal to zero. Q happens when our x equals zero here. And our P is our maximum, okay? So P, we can see here, this is our maximum. So then, when y equals 0, I know that 0 equals 2 minus x plus 1. So, therefore, minus 2 equals minus x plus 1. So, 2 equals x plus 1. So, x equals negative... No. x equals 1. Yeah, 1 plus 1 is 2. Okay, um, so that's how we found out this one. We can check, though, if we, did the, if we negated the modulus, we should get minus 3. 0 equals 2 minus minus x minus 1. We get negative 2 equals x plus 1. Negative 3 equals x. Yep, so we know we're right because we get our two solutions here. So our coordinates for R are 1, 0. When x equals 0, this one's nice and easy, I'm going to get y equals 2 minus 0 plus 1. So I'm going to get 2 minus 1, which is in fact 1. So this coordinate is 0, 1. Then to find my maximum, that's when my modulus equals 0. Okay, so... When x plus 1 equals 0, x equals negative 1. So we know that this would be negative 1 here. So therefore, um, you know, it would be flipped. It's still going to be negative 1. So negative 1. And we can find out what our y coordinate is by substituting it in. And we should get 2 because you should also find that this is going to equal 0. Uh, the other way you could do it is you know that this graph is um, a complete reflection. So you could just look halfway between minus 3 and 1, which you know is minus 1, okay? So there you have it. You found um, P, Q, and R. And then part B says solve f of x equals a half x. So we know a half x is going to be like this it you know i'm i'm assuming that may cross but i'm not sure so we'll find out but we could potentially have another solution um down at the bottom so then let's see exactly what's going on i'm going to get 2 minus x plus 1 equals a half x now remember this we could potentially have two solutions we could have it when we have 2 minus x plus 1 equals a half x or we could have it when 2 minus minus x minus 1 equals a half x. So if we focus on the left-hand side first, 2 minus x minus 1 equals a half x. 1 equals 3 over 2x. x equals 2 over 3. And then the other side, I'm going to get 2 plus x plus 1 equals a half x. So I'm going to get 3, nope. A half 
x equals negative 3, so x equals negative 6. Which, if we go back to the graph, looks about right. Because we said it might cross over here, which will be around negative 6. And then we know it crosses before um, 1 here, so it is about 2 over 3. Again, you can check they work by substituting them into here to double check that you get um, an answer, okay? Okay, well done. Please, can you do these two questions from 2G and then mark your work?